Um, thank you very much for the introduction and to Casual Connect for letting me put this panel together. Um, this is a topic that I was really excited about, um, although I took a little bit of time to finally put the whole panel together. Um, and thanks to John for helping me put this together, because um, it's a really great group of people. Um, so the industry has been around pretty much in its form that we've seen it today, probably for the last five years. So it's a relatively new industry. So I thought it would be great to kind of take a reflection back onto what has worked over the past years, what hasn't worked as this industry has grown from infancy to somewhat maturity. And uh, thanks to John's help, I put together a great panel of speakers. And I collectively counted this morning that there's 21 years of social casino experience on this panel amongst the four of you. So um, I just wanted to go into a little bit of their backgrounds about how amazing this panel is, so then, and we can move into questions. So I wanted to start with Owen, who works with Facebook, Owen O'Donoghue. He's the lead, uh, he's the iGaming lead for Facebook, and you started your career off on Microsoft. And then um, move, before moving to Facebook in 2010, of which then one year later you moved over to become part of the gaming group from the very beginning, I think January of 2012. Yeah, and then uh, Monty, who I've spoken with uh, at the GamesBeat conference a few years ago. Um, impressive, 24 years in the games industry, of which, um, which has earned you the, the feature spot on the website for Casual Connect. Um, and you've been in the industry for six years, co-founding Play Studios in 2011 before moving over to Zanga to become the SVP of games. And then Mark, um, VP of Strategy, who's been at a, with Aristocrat since the beginning of your career for nine years before moving over to their social casino division four years ago in 2013. And then finally, John, who's been so helpful, who's the head of sales for Vidalgo, who's been in the uh, games industry for 15 years, starting off with uh, Microsoft testing Xbox games before breaking off to start your own uh, games company. Um, Grand Circus Game, and then becoming the CEO of Real Big Games in 2013, five years ago, so contributing five more years to this panel. And so I've also been in the social games and uh, social casino industry since the beginning, but my background comes from mainly the real money game side of it, from Europe. I'm American, but I lived over there while this industry sort of grew, grew up, and um, I've been advising casual connect on their social casino stuff for about four years now. So I'm very excited to introduce this panel. I'm going to let each one of the panelists actually introduce themselves more specifically about what they've done in their various roles before we get to the questions. So I want to start. Um, so hi, I'm Owen. Um, uh, th thanks again for having us. Um, uh, it's really great to be here. Um, so yeah, just, just a bit about myself. So um, as Melissa said, I've been at Facebook for about seven years. And you know, really been fortunate that we've really observed uh, the industry uh, uh, grow quite significantly. Um, our team mainly focuses on marketing solutions, so really helping user acquisition, retention strategies, um, going pretty deep there. Um, you know, Facebook's role has, again, been as a partner. Um, we saw the huge growth on, on Canvas, as we call it, Facebook.com, um, really led by, you know, Social Casino was at the heart of that. You look at Double Down, Playtica, Zynga, really helping drive um, and creating that market. Um, and then we were, we were around when the transition to mobile started to happen in 2012, 2013. And that's the, the biggest part of our business now is being a mobile marketing partner for um, a lot of these companies. So I, I think, you know, my experience has just been, you know, it's a category. Um, I actually worked at Paddy Power for a while. So I, I, it was first job out of college. So I had some experience with online casino in the real money space. Never in a million years, I think that there'd be a $4 billion plus industry of people playing these games where there's no cash out. But it kind of goes, this is a really big entertainment product that a lot of people like, and it's just a huge industry. So that's, I guess, my experience, um, but really more of an observer than a, an active participant, I guess. So it's, we just observe, and it's always interesting to see what's going on. But it's good to have both experiences from both the operator and kind of Facebook being observing from kind it's of... It's crazy, and you could just never predict, you know, there's a next hit company on the way or uh, an existing company reinventing itself. So it's it's pretty amazing industry to be part of and, and to, to see. 
yeah, act active participants. I think it's. Uh, <laughs> I think you can still be actively involved in the market uh, as an advertiser, right? So you end up taking a fair percentage of the total uh, market value, I guess. Um, so Mark Beck, uh, I started at uh, uh, Aristocrat making physical slot machines in Australia. I guess pokies in Australia. Um, uh, I was there for almost 10 years um, through finance marketing teams, and then we bought. Uh, a social uh, casino company called Product Madness in 2012. Um, what they were doing at the time was taking actually UK RMG content and making it into a social casino experience. And the kind of investment hypothesis was, hey, let's take the aristocrat slots and put them on the same social casinos. And so we launched Heart of Vegas uh, on Facebook Canvas. And we're actually a little bit late to the early uh, you know, double downs, the platicas of the market. but. We knew kind of straight away that this was something special, and then um, they've slowly rolled out through the mobile platforms. Again, they're just a fraction later than some of the, um, the early movers, but we we're reasonably early in the space. Um, my role there was the VP of Finance in UA at Aristocrat, so uh, helping uh, spend, I guess, a lot of the money and then help count uh, what comes out the bottom. Um, U UA, you know, casino, there's very little organic. Uh, growth and it's a very competitive paid market so growing is driven uh, a lot by how much you're spending in UA which is why we've got Facebook and Padalgo um, on either side of me um, yeah great um, hi everybody I'm John Gagno as Melissa said I've uh, I'm the, the head of sales and business development at Bidalgo. Uh Bidalgo is uh, very fortunate to have been a partner with Facebook for the last seven years as a, a Facebook marketing partner, uh, badged partner in ad tech and, and uh, gaming vertical. Uh, and within that, we've really just sort of, you know, we've worked with everyone in social casino. We've been very fortunate to have huge success there. A um, little bit about my background, as, as Melissa mentioned, I've been in the game industry about 15 years, mostly as a developer. So I've kind of I've been on both sides of uh, you know both developing games and then how do you market them and scale them profitably? Um, so yeah, I'm like I'd be able to lend a lot of um, you know high level knowledge across what's what's currently going on and kind of like the, the history and the trends of uh, companies that have you know risen, fallen, growing today. Um, we we get uh, you know the fortunate. Uh, ability to see the insights uh, across uh, most of the industry. I'm Monty. I'm so old. <laughs> that's, the, that's all this intro has really taught me is that I'm so old. So I started making games a couple of decades ago, and I did traditional stuff: Origin Systems, Maxis, Microprose. Um, uh, and in 1998, started my first company at the f gentle age of 28 to do real money gaming. So we were one of the early iGaming providers in the space and did that until Ugea passed, making it illegal, uh, uh, you know, nine years later. And we did, I don't know, 30 million people through our system and $9 billion of microtransactions. So learned a lot about gaming during that space, uh, ultimately took it into uh, the retail space, doing Brew and J2ME games early on, did all of Jamdat's casino games, uh, and then, you know, founded, co-founded Play Studios, uh, which was, you know, five partners who felt like we knew everything about the space and learned very quickly we knew nothing about the space. Uh, and, you know, a fascinating experience. The company's still, you know, doing well, even though I predicted it's doomed the day I left, but they're doing really well. And uh, joined Zynga about a year ago, and I run uh, Zynga Poker uh, and a few other efforts, including the new Solitaire game, which we bought in February. Um, that's me. Great. One of the things I wanted to do was to just put on a slide. Uh, it's just a comparative. It's um, my spreading of Eiler's research um, into an Excel document, because I couldn't find the 2013 one. Uh, what was, it's his first report and his last report, right? Which was Q2 2013, Q2 2017. And basically, in Q2, it is the top 10. And then for 2013 and then 2017, so it's basically trying to show you um, what, what's changed and what hasn't. Who the players, just to give some perspectives of, as we're talking about five years of lessons learned as a way to help look at the future. So, um, so I just have it there as a, a, a guide. So basically, yesterday we saw 
a number of conflicting messages. And it started off with, um, sorry. It started off with Playtika talking about BI and meta, you know, the snack team and data analytics and the importance of that. And then we moved to, oh, shit, sorry. We moved to, um, here we go. We moved to uh, IGT talking about authentic gaming and the importance of the quality of content. And then from there, we moved on to, to hear about Huge and their 900% growth and the importance of a metagame. And so I guess my question for you is, you know, out of these three things, they're all claiming that these are the most important things. And to me, what do you feel like is the de biggest determinant of, of success? And I kind of have like a bunch of questions lumped into one. So if you could just hear me out and then pontificate all you want on this. But my questions are, is it the quality? Is it the live ops? Is it the metagame? Is it the UA, BI, and analytics? Is it a combination or all? Can you have great games with a mediocre UA and metagame? Vice versa, can you have mediocre content and focus on excellent UA and metagame? Um, or is there just more than possibly one formula? So I'd love to hear your thoughts, because to me, it's a big question. All right. Uh, let me have a crack at that. Um, I think the slide we've got in front of us, the transition to from Facebook Canvas to uh, mobile is pretty obvious. And what sticks out to me, apart from aristocrats not on the first list, and it is on the second list, um, is companies like High Five, uh, GreenTube, that haven't really moved significantly from uh, where they were four years ago. This is companies, High Five has, uh, they produce land-based slots. Um, so this is similar to, you know, IGT, as an example, publishes some of the High Five slots. So this is an example of people that have really, really great slot content and the um, growth we haven't seen from the last four years. So what actually is driving that? Is it app development? Is it analytics? I think you need to be good at a lot of things and slot development, all those things you just talked about, you need to, you know, you need to be pretty good at all of them and then really specialize in one of them as your competitive advantage. So, first of all, I'm extremely relieved to see that Zynga grew over that period of time. Uh, yeah, that, I was actually, when you, when you started talking about the slide, that was my first fear. Uh, but, I, I, you know... Remember, the Zynga one, <laughs> Eilers was only ca capturing the casino. And, uh, I'm, that's the part I'm concerned about. So, the, you know, the, I was asked this question before, uh, and, and there are two important factors uh, that, that I think that our success, uh, the read success in the space. And one was the one that uh, Mark talked about, which is really being good at everything. I mean, you can't, you know, if you're terrible at acquisition, you're not, no matter what, how good the games are, you're not going to succeed. If you're terrible at uh, metagame and progression and economy, no matter how good your user acquisition is, you're not going to succeed. Uh, the, only, the only caveat that is if you're first. First is such an unbelievably big benefit early on that uh, the earlier you got into this business, the more mistakes you're able to make. Um, you know, uh, it seems like such a fresh memory, but we built our first game for Facebook, and when we decided to go to mobile, which was not an easy decision at the time, it was you know the, the, it was still a pretty tough. There was so much money on Facebook. Uh, you know, we decided to build the game differently. No linked economy between the two games, and, and it, was, it was a potentially devastating decision for our, our business, right? Uh, but we built it because we felt like we had built a bad game initially. And we couldn't just fix the game because we had millions of people playing it, that, and we had this rewards program. So uh, we built a new game that wasn't connected. Everybody started over at level one, and it was, you know, doom and gloom in the industry, but we managed to survive it. And I think that had we made that decision now, or a year ago, or 18 months ago, it would have been, it would have been bad for the company. So, being early is a very forgiving position. Yeah, I, I, I definitely agree on being early. You know, I think um, having that that first mover advantage, if you can call it, uh, extremely beneficial. I, I would, you know, just go back to. Uh, it's a really good question because. In my mind, it's um, is it all about the IP and, and the feeling, or is it just this like machine-focused data, you know, uh, management company? Um, it is about being, you know, it's, it's maybe not a good answer, but it is about doing everything well. I, I think what I've always observed in the social casino space and the companies who have really um, just continued to do well, they really 
their attention to detail, um, almost acting like a data company, um, uh, is, is, is second to none. I think um, understanding your lifetime value by user, um, understanding how much you can pay, um, playing around with uh, how risky you want to, uh, to pay for this user, um, understanding every metric. That's the underlying baseline, regardless of whether you have IP, you know, certified by Nevada slot games, or whether you've you've, you've invented the math models yourself. Uh, and that's the underlying baseline. The, the IP, there's also a cultural thing. I think, again, I've worked in in both the European and, and the North American markets, almost three years now each uh, in social casino, and I, I think in, in North America because we're more used to going into, um, you know, going to Vegas, going to the going to casinos, um, there is more attention around, hey, if I can get this IP that's on the casino floor, I know that's going to attract a lot of customers. Uh, while in, uh, I guess, Israel, um, you know, there, look, we maybe don't have that luxury right now unless we buy it, but I'm going to make sure this math model will keep people engaged. Um, but the North American companies have this incredible attention to detail on, on the data side as well. And then a lot of companies who fail don't have that. Um, attention, or they don't have the right people uh, who have that attention as well. So it, it's an interesting one. The, the other observation I would come at as well, so I work on a lot of non-social casino, um, you know, if, if you look at uh, four years ago, the top 10 on iOS, that's completely changed. While in, in the casino space, they've kept their best people, they've kept the best processes, and they've maintained, by and large, their market advantage. So. Uh, it's 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 a really interesting um, uh, it's a really interesting industry from from that side. I, I think the I, I think the CPI is, is like what we've talked about is all these resources required to make be good at everything as well as really really high CPIs. This kind of creates a natural barrier that it's very difficult for new entrants to come into the market because of all these reasons. Uh, last thing I'll I'll add on. I often tell you know new clients who come to me with a new product, uh, you know, they ask this exact question, like, what am I missing? Like, do I just need amazing UA? And what I try to explain is that you can kind of take like a mediocre product and put amazing UA on top of it and have a mild success. But it, you know, it's truly special when you do have like a great product. So I kind of think of like splitting the disciplines along, you know, the marketing and analytics and the product. Uh, if you can combine, you know, the best of both worlds, that's when you can really make a breakthrough into into the the Eilers report. <laughs> I mean, you, you you made a comparison to the games industry versus social casino. It, are social casino players maybe less promiscuous, so they tend to be a little bit more sticky? I mean, the numbers that I've heard that from like. What Playtica has acquired, the revenue that they're generating from the players that they acquired in year one and two, is astounding. So, are they just less? Are they just you're, you're, no, you're, you're right. They, they are far more stickier, um, particularly the whales and social casino. Now, there's, there's really two genres that stick out for me. Uh, MMO games, um, so Supercell, Machine Zone, uh, Plarium. Um, they would have similar lifetimes, different audience, but similar lifetimes to social casino. You take casual titles. I mean, you know, you're, unless you're like a candy crush, um, you're... Your lifetime is maybe six months to a year, um, if you're lucky with, with players, and you do see a lot of huge hits, so they rise into the, the top 10 grossing for a few weeks uh, on the, uh, the Play Store or the iOS Store, and then they, they come out because the game experience is a lot different. What we've seen on Facebook and what we see with our partners on mobile is that the, the same players who are playing in 2009 are still there today, um, still, sp still spending, and um, so, you know, it's, it's, it's again, I think, an advantage of the industry. If you know your numbers right, you can be more aggressive and you can outbid a lot of those non-casino companies. And that's what effectively has been happening um, across us and other channels for a while. So it's been a couple of years since I've seen the data. Last time I saw the data is the average slots monetizer plays eight slots games. They only monetize in one of them or heavily in one of them, but they play eight games. So they do play games. They do download new games and try new games. Uh, or you know, or the the hundreds of millions of dollars that we're throwing into the user acquisition would would have long been used up by now, right? So we we are getting, and, and again, most of these the differences here. I mean, we luckily we had a transform a, a platform shift, which gave us an all all a new opportunity to go after these same players as they as the smartphone penetration got bigger, better, especially in the older 
uh, uh, demographics. But uh, you know, but early is is still super critical. But you know, but there are look, there are a bunch of companies on here, huge, probably most notably that uh, that wasn't on this list at all 18 months ago or 24 months ago. So it's still possible to build an awesome product and get your people to play it. And you have perspective, interestingly, from like a reward, like my Vegas was very rewards driven, very reward heavy, moving over to Zango, which is a very different kind of player, a very different model. Do you notice a difference in the type of player and the type of behavior pattern? Everything is different between Play Studios and Zynga, like literally from everything, you know, uh, uh, so in, in good and bad, right? So uh, we, at Play Studios, we are much more about trying to create a vision and, uh, and, and give that to players. Like we had a very stylized look and feel. We had this partnership with MGM and 26 other uh, reward partners. And, uh, and, and so we were trying to create this, this experience that we imagined. Uh, you know, Zynga has been always much more about listening to what their players want or what the data is telling them and changing their product no matter how old it is. I mean, Zynga Poker is 10 years old this month, right? And it's evolved dramatically. So I, I, the approaches are very different. Uh, but, uh, you know, but whenever, whenever you look at uh, distribution of payers, uh, how much money they spend, how frequently they spend, what they look like, all of our games look the same. All of them look the same. We think that we acquire a different kind of player, a different quality player. We don't. They're very similar. And, I, and, I, and as I look at you know, games like Farmville and Cityville and Frontierville's old data uh, across the board, the, the, it's the same there too, right? I mean, this is just the way people monetize in games. Social Casino is one of the first ones that, that really just took off all the controls on what you could spend and how fast you could spend it. And so, you know, we have a lot of attention on us for that particular feature. But, you know, if you look at whales in Farmville, which has been around forever, uh, you know, there are people who've spent hundreds of thousands of dollars in Farmville too, right? So um, I guess, got it. Two different questions that I want to ask. One kind of like leads on from that, but I'll give it to that in a bit. I wanted to go back and talk about like a little bit about the early days, especially with Facebook. And it was kind of a bit like the Wild West. Like literally, you wake up in the morning, you figure out what's on the dev blogs, and then change your game. Like because you were changing your algorithms massively. And you used to have a very free economy where you, for one paid player, you'd give 10, 11 free players. You know, so the, this economy of free, you know, of organic versus paid was very different. And then overnight you change your, your philosophy and then the, you know, the market moved to, to mobile quickly as well. Um, so I guess my, my question is, you know, what is the status of paid versus organic right now? given that there's been such a big change. And also, what I found in the early days was, and you know, Sean Ryan would always say this, all these app developers are successful in spite of Facebook changing everything on them. And do you remember those days? And then, but what was interesting is, maybe if, if you guys could maybe share some advice about um, how important it was to be able to adapt quickly, because I kind of felt like the companies that were able to adapt quickly back in those days were able to survive. Um, and then if you see anything changing like that, to be able to be able to, to stay on your toes and change quickly. I want to say, first of all, I rage quit Facebook. As, as my first company, my first company that had Facebook games, uh, I was scaling my very first casino game. I don't know when it was, it was forever ago. Uh, and right whenever they changed the uh, messaging system about how we could virally promote our game in a very spammy way. Uh, and like we, ha we were literally just growing the business and, and we went from having a ton of organic installs to none and uh, in a panic I went and talked to every other social network to try to get my game on every social network uh, and ended up selling the company uh, to High Five Networks. Uh, and really it was, I was really just mad at Facebook. So. <laughs> And, and, and I can, I've had that, that feeling with Facebook, you know, I don't know how many times. I've had the conversation, you know, like uh, uh, things change too quickly, and especially early on, whenever the smaller you were, they just didn't have as many people that could help us or anybody as dedicated to the space. So it was, it was pretty tough early on. But, uh, you know, but we were a pretty adaptable group, right? So, uh, 
you know, uh, so I, I think that you wouldn't be on this list if you weren't able to adapt to that kind of stuff. Yeah, I, I, I think that there's some definitely a lot of fair points. I, I, you know, having been around during those times, there's a couple of things. We didn't necessarily adapt all the, the models ourselves overnight. Um, a lot of it is user driven. So we, you know, when we started to really do this, uh, we introduced open graph stories. So I could automatically tell my friends, hey, I'm playing a level of Candy Crush or um, uh, whatever game. As Facebook grew and more people grew their friend network, connecting to different groups, to different pages, you have all these stories competing for somebody's attention in their news feed. And games was just one of those categories for some people who would have seen a lot of organic stories became less relevant because they didn't interact with those stories. And the classic one is, you know, you, you see some long lost friend from high school and they just completed level 58 in Candy Crush and you're like, <laughs> I don't care about this, but I'll interact with the baby pictures. Okay, well, we'll show you more baby pictures. That's literally what happened um, from that side. And, but I, you know, I, again, it's, it's a good point because there's a lot of people built, built their business models um, off that. And I you know, distinctly remember um, 2011, we would have a lot of conversations around, hey, your K factor is one or two or three, so we can be more aggressive on a CPI with this audience. Uh, um, we would do like, uh, we would do measurement tests of what's a paid user versus an organic user from different uh, segments and, and we could start to really map out the business. I, again, with just the constraints of so much content and people connecting to different content on Facebook, um, you know, those organic game stories started to drop. For, for me, um, when mobile came around, I, my view was, you know, only really, if you're, you know, doing a business plan for a game, um, really look at, um, the, the acquisition, the paid side. Anything organic is a bonus, but your core business in terms of how you're, you're paying your staff, paying your marketing, developing your game, should be based off realistic costs uh, of acquisition. And I think the, the worry I see sometimes with the app stores now is a lot of companies are shooting, not necessarily in casino, but um, they're shooting for these huge multi-million dollar launches, um, almost like a movie uh, studio or like a, a, maybe a console game. And it's inherently very risky um, uh, because they're trying to shoot up the charts and get that organic. And what's happening is we're seeing then the app stores adapt. So Google are now saying, well, look, it's not about total installs anymore necessarily. We're going to start to bring in other metrics. So how do you adapt to that? And, and, and those models are going to continue to change as the platforms fundamentally want to give a variety. They want to keep their users engaged. Um, so, you know, it, it, it was unfortunate um, uh, that it changed over time. As somebody in the game side of Facebook, I would have liked to have kept it going. Um, but it's one of those, from a business point of view, only, you know, on what you can pay and what you can physically see, build your business off that, not necessarily on the organic piece. That would be my view right now. So I love developing games for Facebook. You know, we could do 20 experiments a day. You know, and those days are long over, as my developers are very glad because they can actually develop software now as opposed to me literally introducing 20 experiments in a day. But you know, when you had a big audience on Facebook, it was just such a, a, a powerful uh, engine for making decisions quickly, right? And, I, and, and part of it is uh, one of the reasons that uh, whenever I inherited uh, uh, Zynga Poker, you know, I'd, I, the first thing I felt about the product is it had no voice. Right, and what had happened is we had experimented everything that was unique and different about the product away uh, with these tiny, you know, 300 basis point improvements, right? And so, uh, you know, trying to recapture that, uh, especially in a, in a longer, uh, more professional development cycle, was great. But uh, the nostalgia part of me really misses being able to go in in the morning and say, "I think this." Here's my hypothesis. Let me get 300,000 people to tell me if this is correct or not by lunch. Uh, it was, I said it was awesome, but you know, you definitely have to be a little more professional now. I think there's uh, a few things. So um, the, the first uh, movement is, is Facebook just re reducing the amount of spam in the, uh, the channel. So um, before we were, Product Madness was a, a social casino company, it was doing viral spam on Facebook, right? This is how they were making money, and it did. They changed overnight, and the business collapsed. And it was a change overnight that, as a user, as a Facebook user, it's like, actually, this is a better thing. We don't want a 1,000 notifications uh, about this. So there are changes, right? They're cleaning up the platform. You know, back on 
uh, even in 2012, 2013, you could buy users for you know two bucks versus you know ten bucks now. So it's 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 this kind of shift has happened um, where they've reduced the amount of spam. The second thing which has happened is around the organic installs is they've, we're finding different uh, ad channels to effectively um, prioritize your ad in front of, or your app in front of someone else. And I think the best example is the Apple search ads, right? So previously I searched slots, I scroll down, I install uh, a slot game. Now I search slots and an ad comes up. So this is literally taking from organic installs and moving it into paid. So uh, it's a twofold kind of reducing of spam and then new ad units to, um, uh, I guess, replace your organic installs. So the days of, um, the days of a lot of organic installs, a lot of um, kind of cheap paid installs are, are, are kind of over. All right. Um, and yeah, I kind of want to piggyback on that and ask you a little bit more because uh, for sure, like I, when I when I think about the organic channels that existed at the start of Social Casino compared to today, like I can't even really think of, you know, a, a clear direction of like, okay, if I want organics in Social Casino, what do I even do? Like, the only thing I can think of is maybe app like App Store optimization, yep. and like you know, search there. But I, you, can you come up with anything else? <laughs> yeah, I think like if you think you know, three or four years ago, you you you'd burst a huge amount of incentivized installs and you'd go up the charts. And this is the kind of spam that we, they don't want, right? You don't want fake installs. You don't want um, uh, people kind of gaming the system. You want it to be a kind of a fair marketplace. Um, so yeah, I think for me at least, the highest correlation to organic installs is your top grossing position, which is a very difficult thing to fake because it's the amount of revenue that's been uh, paid in the app. I want to say that I used to say that Social Casino was the biggest oxymoron that I've ever encountered in my career. I think that organic casino players <laughs> is going to be right there too. Like, I, we used to talk about organic a lot until I saw Words with Friends and even Zynga Poker and saw what actual organic looks like. But yeah, I think organic is it's a word that comforts us at night, <laughs> but I don't know that it really exists. The last thing I'd say, I, I, there is, with anything, you know, as platforms mature, it, it typically moves to more paid models. I mean, uh, Google, Apple, Facebook. I, I, I think, again, where you look at the first movers, so I look at, you know, Double Denzing, uh, Playtika, they took the risk on Facebook early on and they got the rewards. So if you're thinking of building a business, I mean, what are the new channels out there? Is it Amazon? Is it Facebook Game Room? There's all these instant messaging games. Um, you know, they are the sorts of channels that you can get organic in the future. Uh, they'll eventually probably become paid, though. Uh, but that's the, that's the first mover taking the risk. Q4. Uh, yeah. <laughs> what I showed you was the first and the last Eilers report. But what I didn't show you was the other games that have come in and out uh, in, in, in the interim, in the past five years, four years. And um, one of the things I've noticed is sort of sub-niches, which is the steppers of the classic slots. Um, and both of these companies have come into the top 15 and have come out of the top 15. So, um, you know, and, and even before um, DGN came in, they had a nine month just soared to the top, but their fast follower, which was Rocky Games, sort of struggled for a little bit, did a, a you know, a fast follow onto DGN, soared right, pa you know, surpassed DGN, um, so my question is, one, I'd love for you guys to talk a little bit about the viability and the strength of these subsectors and how um, viable they are going forward, but also maybe if you could give advice a little bit about, you know, yesterday we saw that Huge had 900% growth, but we all knew that they struggled a little bit in the beginning until they launched a very differentiated product, which was their clubs. I also love their, their win celebration, which I think is a huge factor. Um, but maybe if you could speak a little bit about to some of the game developers in the audience who are not in the top 20, you know, you know, do you just continue to innovate until something hits? You know, what's some of the advice that you can give, to, you know, based on some of the history of the trends that we've seen? Sure. So yeah, I think like we can kind of orient the talk around like you know the 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 underserved markets that were captured, you know. That's where the new value has been created. Like uh, you know, Melissa talked about DGN and, and Rocket, like two clients I know very well, know their the whole backstory there. Um, yeah, so I think like that's probably very useful for the audience to think about like what you know what was driving 
like all the new innovation lately. And I think Mark can probably speak a lot about well, like Merka's point to us. Uh, but uh, I'm also curious like to hear like if there's anything on people's minds in terms of like the next underserved market, like where can you grow from? Well, we, we saw yesterday that like table games, no one has, has hit it there. But my question, I guess, which I didn't articulate well, are they outliers or are they the rule? Right? I, Do you just keep innovating until you figure it out? I don't know. I mean, I, there's, but, but a lot of those companies, you know, who, who are still very successful, um, you know, one, the top 15 has become more competitive. Um, uh, so there's just that market side. There's a lot of people stuff. I mean, you know, companies get bought out. Um, they maybe, they're not necessarily the primary focus of their parent companies. And, you do see um, if that focus uh, slips or moves on to something else, which is actually, for a lot of those companies, is fair enough, there's bigger opportunities they're, they're, they're trying to capture, um, that, that, those, that these subcategories um, uh, uh, begin to fall out. I, you know, I think if you look at the, you know, DGN just, I think it's just one, it was a real, like, I, I felt, you know, shot of life into the industry where we're going to take the most simple, uh, three real mechanical slots and, you know, really hungry team, you know, Damon and, and, and team and just absolutely crush it. And, uh, you, know, it, you know, you see huge coming up, it gives you a lot of hope. Um, so I think, you know, there's other companies who have maintained in the top 15 um, and they followed. Um, I, I, look, the, the, if, if you're in a, a startup situation, um, one, the category is definitely, we see every year, there's one rising star every year. Two, then, there's other ways to make money from this, and we start to look at the, um, not just in-app uh, purchases, but in-app advertising and the value that that is, is driving. So um, there's a whole category of casinos um, underneath, if you look at the top 10 in, in Google Play uh, and, and iOS, um, uh, who are making a, a pretty um, handsome sum just uh, offering advertising. Um, so instead of like getting, you know, spending to get more coins, one, run a rewarded video. And if you start to break down the CPMs that you can get as a publisher, it's actually pretty, it's a pretty interesting business. Like I think uh, Harpan from Solitaire is a great example of, of, of that type of a business. So um, I, I don't think there, I think there's, there's definitely some, uh, you know, issue, focus issues with some of those companies maybe. Um, but look, you can, there's a lot of underserved categories to still get into and other ways to make money apart from in-app purchases. So differentiation is important. Right? I mean, there's no doubt about differentiation is important. I, I think that if you're going to uh, copy a market leader and enter the space right now, you're going to have a very hard time. Right? And, and, but, but I don't want to crack the door and say that, that you can enter the space with an innovation and get to the top. I just don't think that that is likely. You know, uh, I, it's happened. It, but we tend to look at the outliers, not the 1,400 other companies that followed that path that failed, right? So um, uh, I don't, I, I think that, and I also think that um, the big companies are much, uh, now that we've acquired a whole bunch of businesses, are, are much more agile than they were about fast following innovation. You know, I, I watched scatter slots closely and we made that decision quarterly on whether or not we wanted to incorporate some of those elements or not. We watched Big Fish early on and made those decisions and, and, and uh, uh, you know, you see some of the innovations in like Konami was uh, based on uh, their, their redemption system in Big Fish, which I still am a big fan of. So, I mean, I, I think we can react very quickly to innovation. I, I don't think that, um, I think that for the biggest companies, DGN's incredible success uh, was still relatively modest improvement over what they would have done had they followed. And, uh, and, and a whole bunch of companies, including Zynga, decided to jump into that extremely late as opposed to doing it early and didn't have much success doing it. So I, I, and I, I think it's a very different space than it was a couple of years ago. Yeah, I think if you look at uh, total U.S. slot machines, it's like um, I think it's about a million slot machines total in the U.S., and 30% of them, 25% of them are these three real mechanical slot reels. So on one side, we've taken this video content, it's working in the slot market. Actually, it's relatively obvious to most people now that the three reel stepper um, would work. I will say that at Aristocrat, um, they own about 0% of the stepper market share. So for us, it was not something we had to take the video uh, content to market. 
Um, I think you're right, the way to succeed in the market is to innovate and to choose a specific subsection and go after it. The, the, the kind of good things and bad things about games is that we all play our competitors' games and yes, we make kind of um, choices whether we want to um, you know, take features to market that are similar. Um, for me, just straight out copying features or just replicating what other people are doing is just a way to get to kind of mediocrity. I think the scatter slots, which um, is about the 10th largest overall uh, US you know, slot game, it was a different enough approach that the market responded to it so we could scale. I, I think this is the right approach. Does anyone have questions for this very astute panel? Uh, so like a couple of you, I also come from a background in European online gambling. And uh, in the online gambling space, you see a lot of crossover between games, slots, and poker, et cetera. Uh, you guys are talking about a lot about innovation. Uh, do you think that innovation in the social gaming space is coming from crossover games, or do you think it's coming from somewhere else? Well, when you say crossover games, do you mean just like, um, like a double down, like multi-product yes. app versus a single slot app? Yes. I made the best blackjack game that nobody's ever played. <laughs> <laughs> All right? So, you know, and, and I, I don't think that, and again, you know, uh, Hit It Rich has had video poker, it's had blackjack, it's introduced tons of games that have had unbelievably poor conversion performance. Even cross promotion between Zynga Poker and the slot products is very, very weak. You know, so I don't think that uh, uh, a, uh, a casino product uh, is, is more appealing than a slot product. Uh, I think that, uh, in, I, have, I certainly haven't seen any data that would encourage that kind of crossover. Um, and in, and again, I put 40 economies through my blackjack game trying to get people to spend money on it. Uh, I'm not going to jump into the table game market anytime soon after the experience. Uh, I, think I think table games as well, it's very difficult to have anything protectable. You know, it's, it's reasonably easy to make a uh, roulette wheel or a blackjack wheel. Slots is much more protectable in terms of the IP that you're creating. Those are your slot machines. Um, I think this, and I agree with Monty, I think the audience is slightly different, the people who play table games versus people who play slot games. And if I think about just having an app on my phone, I personally would prefer to have a blackjack app and a slots app. So we're sitting here looking back after five years, and I'm not going to say another five years from now, because that's like dog years in this industry. But if you were sitting here in three years, what do you think would be the lesson learned? Can you believe how quickly Merca continued to grow? <laughs> um, I think it will be, there'll be, uh, we're always surprised that someone will enter the market with something new. I think this is for sure. Uh, this will continue happening. I think there'll be um, a new platform potential, potentially open up. Uh, as you talked about games room, messenger app, you know, people talk about VR. I'm not such a believer in that for slots, but these kind of things, you know, is there another first channel? I think this is potential. Um, but I think a lot of the apps that we see here will still be there in the same positions in a few years' time. Yeah, I think that the conversation will be why hasn't the top 10 changed more than, you know, like there was a, a you know, Steve from GSN used to do this uh, a status of the slots in the social casino industry every year at, at GDC, and he would show last year's top 10 social casino against this year's top 10 social casino. And almost every year, it was the exact same 10 companies in the exact same position with one new entrant or one company uh, leaving the space. And I think that that's the, that's the reality we're in. Uh, that's certainly the reality we are in in poker and slots. Now, I think that there'll be innovation in a space. I think that people will come in and go. But what'll happen is that Somebody will come in and go, and they'll get bought by one of us. Right. That's what's going to happen. So it's going to be Zynga. Right. That would be what I was going to add, was that you know, in three years, we could be talking about, like, wow, there was a huge consolidation of very large companies. I don't think that that is outside the realm of possibility. It's, yeah, it is. I mean, it, it's difficult to see huge disruption to that list. Definitely, there'll be some new entrants. Um, there's only two things I could see really changing in three to five years. That's one if there's just some new platform. I can't even think what that would be. Um, and then there's first mover advantage and so on. 
theater is, look, I mean, the specter of, uh, you know, online um, uh, real money uh, uh, gambling being legalized across more states in the U.S. And that may change things where some of these companies say, look, you know, maybe we need to pivot towards more real money or maybe we need to acquire or maybe there's some entrance from either in, the North, America, in North America or in Europe start to, to come in pretty big into the market. But beyond those two things, it's difficult to see much of a change. But that was one of my earlier questions that I didn't get to, which was, it was amazing that early on in the industry, the influence of the online gaming companies had in the sector, you know, 888 acquiring um, Mytopia in like 2010, and then Playtech making a whole bunch of acquisitions with a verbal statement saying, we will be the largest social casino provider in the industry, you know, period. And then you saw BWIN try to get in with its high profile, not so great success, and then pull out. Um, and I guess my question is, if there is a coexistence, and you know, with real money not really taking off in the United States, with, with the coexistence of real money uh, pervasive in Europe and not in the United States, if, that, if the United States were to legalize, how would that impact the industry? I mean, we all saw from Adam's report that Europe, you know, does well, but nothing compared to the United States, Canada, Australia, with the growth coming out of Asia. Um, does it does it stagnate this industry? Does it cannibalize? What um, it, it, there's only one kind of real test, and um, that Facebook's ran. That was in 2012, where we allowed a few companies to run. Uh, yeah, I uh, on that. yeah, which is what we thought. Look, we thought that. The end game, and again, it was our view. Uh, oh, the, well, the end game here is is real money. Uh, there definitely is some crossover. Some people want to play both. They want to migrate from free, but but there does also seem to be um, different audiences um, there as well. Um, you know, predicting at the U.S., all social casino players won't convert over, but a, a decent chunk will. And I don't think it cannibalizes. I think it does grow it overall. It's do I want to you know be a really high roller and put tens of thousands in every week, or hey, just put twenty dollars, get a lot of coins, just play the game I enjoy. Uh, again, it comes down to the difference of players. Or is it purely entertainment, or is it hey, I I want to I want to return? It could also then maybe drive a lot more of the table games, um, uh, you know, drive more more of those um, uh, types of experiences too. So I I have always felt I was in the real money gaming space for 10 years, I've always felt that convergence is a myth. I don't, it, it doesn't exist, right? I think that we have the closest connection at Play Studios between real money gamers and free-to-play gamers. Uh, and, uh, you know, there's, I, 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 first of all, I, maybe I'm just being hopeful, because I did, I mean, I can do 80 releases a year, and it, when it was real money gaming, I did three releases a year. It's awful. Like, I hate building software in a regulated market and, uh, and work very hard with the ISGA and other organizations to make sure that that never happens because it's awful for everybody. So I hope that, that, that so I think there will be relationships, continue relationships between Caesars and MGM and other companies like that to, to broaden their audience, to get more people to come in the door, to experience their uh, 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 resort casinos as a destination, but to to bridge the gap between playing a slot free to play and then landing in Las Vegas or a regulated space and suddenly my slot machine's real money, I just don't think that's ever gonna happen. You know, this is, we are at best uh, a source of leads for that industry. I think the UK is probably a good example, right? So you can play real money gaming slots online and yet social casino still has a decent chunk of the market made from the UK. So these are people that are, chosen to play these type of games for fun rather than playing for real money. So it shows that there is um, two audiences here. I think the overlap is pretty high, to be honest. And I think if they did regulate uh, real money gaming, um, it would have a impact in social, uh, social casinos. So if I could play slots uh, CPIs for... Will go up. CPIs will go way up, yes. Well, thank you for that. Um, I actually do think that there's somewhat of an overlap. There's a really great story someone shared with me. Um, and, and I think it all depends on how it's implemented. But if you have high minimum fees on the slots, I think you'll see uh, a less of an overlap. I think you'll see players cohabitating in both 
there, um, there's one casino that saw its foot traffic not move, but the revenue per machine went down precipitously. And so they started looking in the security cameras and following players on the floor. And what it turned out was that players would sit there and play, but the minimum on their, re on their minimum uh, slot reel spend pull was so high that after a while they'd take a break but not want to give up the machine. So they'd start pulling out social casinos and Candy Crush. So I do think that there is somewhat of an overlap, but how that's implemented and whether cannibalization, I think, has a lot to do with the implementations. But I wanted to thank you guys for an amazing panel and thank the audience. And I want to thank you guys especially for making my job so easy. <laughs>